everybody. Welcome to today's show. My name is Spencer Walsh. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I do appreciate it. And yeah, we got we got a good one for you on the show. Trust me. Here's what we are going to be talking about. We will be starting with a very interesting campaign disclosure showing that Senate Democrats in Exxon Mobil, in this Exxon Mobil expose here got almost three hundred and thirty three thousand uh, dollars between the two or the three of them I think it was that were in there. Also, George Bush with a rare intervention talking about how he is worried about the plight of Afghan women as the U.S. finally withdraws troops from that war. Meanwhile, Ken Starr, the lawyer who hounded Bill Clinton over his affair um, with Monica Lewinsky, now is exposed with being too close to Jeffrey Epstein, probably something you never want to get exposed with. Also, Joe Biden, one of the biggest pro-climate presidents, at least in his words, has, under his administration, approved more, or improved, saw an increase of drilling approvals for oil and gas, uh, despite his big, bold Biden climate pledge. And also, in Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, the president there, may hiccup himself to death. We'll tell you all about that. This is News Flash 540. Welcome to the show. All right, everybody, so we are starting the show today with a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a kind of follow-up on some old reporting that we did, uh, I think, probably about a week or so or two ago. Um, This is in Common Dreams here. Jessica Corbett writing, a pair of reports published Tuesday in the wake of a damning expose featuring secretly recorded ExxonMobil lobbyists further eliminated the fossil fuel giants' efforts to increase powerful centrists, influence powerful centrists in Congress and beyond. They know who... They're they're going for they knew they know who they need to get to get their priorities done and and we are finding more and more about how they go about getting the quote unquote support of these senators. The New Republic's Kate Aronoff revealed that centrist think tanks are raking in Exxon Cash, citing a company report. While HuffPost Alexander Kaufman revealed an analysis by the advocacy group Oil Change U.S. of campaign contributions to six Democratic senators named in Unearth's June expose. That was, of course, the um, the big report, the big uh, leaked audio with this guy who we talked about thought was going in for a job interview, but really was talking to a Greenpeace activist from the U.K. about how the the, the big um, the big plan, what their big plan was to get all the pretty much climate priorities out of this bipartisan infrastructure bill they're working on. So the video from Unearthed Greenpeace's UK uh, investigative journalism arm was of course the featuring one current and former one one current and one former XN employee Keith McCoy and Dan Easley who thought they were discussing the company's lobbying efforts with a recruitment consultant. While Exxon Mobil chairman and CEO Darren Woods claimed that McCoy and Easley made disturbing and inaccurate comments about our positions on a variety of issues, including climate change policy and our interaction with elected officials, the reporting has increased scrutiny of the company's lobbying and finances over the past two weeks. And I think that really should be the purpose for everybody because it's so, so easy for these companies to come out and be incredibly two-faced, being like, oh, we're, we're caring about climate change. We want to put out this big public face of maybe like buy some YouTube ads so that some, you know, 18 to 24s see an Exxon logo next to, I don't know, us picking up picking up trash on the side of the beach. You know, we're, we're doing more. We're committing to reducing our carbon emissions. That's why we can fix climate change together. Like, um, it, really, some of the stuff is just absolutely nauseating. Um, um, and I do want to, I, I do want to go into this, Let's just at, least, at least get a little bit of this, there's just some just crazy, crazy ads that they use and they just lie to people with, and then they of course turn around and do this. Like that is really what they, and they are of course research shows. It's been there. It's, it's been proven for a long time, uh, up as early as the 1990s, they knew about the devastating effects that climate change would have before a lot of the public. They had the scientists, they did the science, and not only did they do that, but they paid lawmakers off 
and um, donated to their campaigns in, you know, a lot of times completely legal ways to get this stuff from getting uh, stop the stuff from getting out there. So the oil change U.S. analysis focused on campaign disclosures of six of the Democratic lawmakers, uh, six McCoy mentioned, Chris Coons, uh, Joe Biden's top ally in the Senate, a former Delaware senator himself, Biden is. Of course, so he's really relying on this incredibly pro-bank, uh, pro-corporate, big-money interest guy. Chris Coons in there, Maggie Hassan, much of the same. Mark Kelly, Arizona, uh, in the same boat there. Joe Manchin, Kristen Cinema, and John Tester. So these lobbyists are now working hard to preserve the fossil fuel uh, subsidies and block climate action. So uh, oil change U.S. analysis shows that Exxon's current lobbyists gave the six Exxon Dems named in the unearthed shocking videos over thirty uh, $330,000. This is, again... Between the six of them, asked on a May video call, which lawmakers Exxon targets? McCoy first, again, named Shelley Moore Capito, uh, and then he continued about, uh, you know, shouting out Joe Manchin. I talk to his office every week. He's the kingmaker on this because he's a Democrat from West Virginia, which is a very conservative state. Uh, and he's not shy about staking his claim early and completely changing the debate. On the Democratic side, we look for the moderates on these issues. So it's Mansions, it's Cinemas, it's the Testers, Senator Coons. He's a co- close relationship with President Joe Biden. There's a direct quote, taking these words out of my mouth. The other Republicans, Coy- McCoy named, were Senators uh, John Barrasso, uh, John Cornyn, and Steve Daines. He know that it is easier to have conversations with Senators who are up for re-election in 2022 because there's a captive audience uh, they know you. they need you, and I need them. They both need each other, and that is what they're really about. That is what they're trying to do, and what they're trying to do is make sure that everybody continues to scratch everybody's back. Well, we see you know, heat waves spiking up 100-degree temperatures in northern Canada. We got people in the United States Senate uh, completely and utterly focused about how they can prepare best for their next election campaign, and we have the good folks at ExxonMobil willing to pay their campaign, uh, pay pay their way, uh, pay their way to another re-election through copious amounts of campaign donations, three hundred thirty thousand um, dollars alone between the six candidates in just in this period. Um, it has been very very clear again the, that these candidates they know what they're the, uh, and these these senators they know what their bread is buttered and they know what they need to do to keep that bread being buttered. And a lot of times that determines, the, again, the difference between them being reelected or not uh, here. So Colin Rees, the senior campaigner um, at Oil Change U.S., who conducted the analysis, found that over the past decade, uh, six Democrats collectively received nearly 333000 from lobbies, political action committees, excuse me, and uh, lobbying firms. Affiliated with Exxon Mobil. This story is about how lobbyists curry favor and specifically about how Exxon's current lobbyists have spent decades currying favor uh, of these six, the favor of these six Democrats to position themselves to do things like safeguard fossil fuel subsidies and pare down infrastructure packages. We've told Kaufman Exxon has hired these firms and lobbyists because they've contributed hundreds of thousands of dollars to these Democrats both before and after they're hired by Exxon. Tester, whose office did not comment on the story, led the group with $99,000. $99,000, followed by Cinema, uh, who got $70,000. Coons got $68,650. Manchin got $64,864. Hassan got $26,000. She must be kind of a junior junior contender. They they must not be too worried about her uh, votes. They don't have to to buy her off here. Um, But... Kelly finishes off with a, a measly fifteen hundred. There, he he's got to get his numbers up. He's not he's not pro pro fossil fuel enough, guys. Come on, like we this is I think it's very very important to understand and continue to lead the, with these stories and put these stories out in front because uh, a lot of the times when it comes down to it, these people are just not being honest about who they're actually fighting for. They'll say it time and time again. Joe Biden himself will say it as well. Um, and we'll get to a story with this a little bit later in the show about how U.S. drilling approvals have just been increasing all the way straight up through this this Joe Biden administration, despite all this great rhetoric about, oh, he's going to be the climate president, he's going to be the one that saves us, and um, really cares about making sure uh, climate is uh, well taken care of, and there's real action done on this. 
Um, Kelly is, of course, a newcomer to the Senate. He does not expect any accept any corporate back money, which his spokesperson highlighted on Tuesday. He told Huff Poe that he's not met with any individual in the original Exxon video and has not spoken with anyone from this company in the Senate. So, but but still, you know, he he gets that personal. It's a, it's a little bit harder for him because you can't just bundle through the pack way. Um, but what you can do is do you know individual con- i believe the limit on that federally is about eighteen hundred dollars so they're coming up right up against that with kelly and the fifteen hundred dollars that they threw to his campaign but yeah these are significant amounts and you better believe these senators are seeing it they're knowing where the bread is buttered and they're they're talking to these people a lot of them especially joe manchin are talking to these people regularly regularly and if you don't think that the voices of the people in the video that I'm about to play here, have a much, much, much bigger in, uh, impact than you know a thousand Twitter comments, a thousand activists, a thousand phone calls to your representative. Then you're you're crazy. You just don't understand how politics works. Here is yeah. Here's here's this video talk about how from Greenpeace unearthed with this lobbyist. We're playing defense because McCoy. The, the President Biden's talking about this big infrastructure package and he's going to pay for it by increasing corporate taxes. You stick to highways and bridges, then a lot of the, the negative stuff starts to come out because... Right. For you guys. Because there's, there's a germaneness, right? There's, there's, it, it, that doesn't make any sense for a highway bill. Why, why would you put in, why would you put in a, uh, uh, something on uh, uh, emissions reductions on climate change uh, to oil refineries in a highway bill? Who's the crucial guys for you? Well, Senator Capito, who is the um, who chairs the um, uh, Senate, uh, who's the ranking member on Environment and Public Works, Joe Manchin. I talk to his office every week. Um, he is the kingmaker uh, on this because he's a Democrat from West Virginia, which is a very conservative state. Um, so he is, uh, and, and he's not shy about s- sort of staking his claim early yeah. and completely changing the debate. So, so, so. On the Democrat side, we look for the moderates mm-hmm. on these issues. So it's the mansions, it's the cinemas, it's the testers. Um, other also, ones that aren't talking yeah. about is Senator Coons, who has a very close relationship from Delaware, who has a very close relationship with Senator Biden. So we've been working with his office. As a matter of fact, our CEO is talking to him next Tuesday. Oh, nice. It's going to be it's going to be great to uh, see them link up, and I'm sure they'll do great things, right? Anyway, yeah, this is just a, a another one of the billions and billions of examples, um, like that that show how completely bought and paid for uh, our government is, and really why uh, a lot of this stuff doesn't get done. And people, like American people, whether they be you know Republican, non-voting, Democrat, independent, whatever. They want at least some action on climate change, at least more than they are now. And if the infrastructure stuff, the climate change stuff in the infrastructure stuff has been proven to be popular, especially with Joe Biden, um, Joe Biden's big base to support the Democratic Party. Um, but they just do not seem to have the political will to go through with it. And you'll wonder, this is why. Um, so, yeah, so pretty pretty much what happened here is. Um, an Exxon Mobil spokesperson said the company complies with all the blah, 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 exposing Wood statements earlier this month in response to the expose. The spokesper- echoing Wood statements earlier this month, the spokesperson added that McCoy's recorded remarks do not represent what the company is trying to do here. So the Greenpeace USA climate director on Tuesday said that in a statement uh, refer- responding to analysis that these six Democratic senators can say they aren't influenced by big oil, but they're empty words until they prove it. To gain back public trust, the Exxon 11, and especially the six Democrats who expect, uh, accepted money from Exxon, must commit to no more meetings with fossil fuel companies whether they craft the infrastructure and reconciliation bills. How about don't meet with them ever again? Because they shouldn't be having any influence on in the politics if you, at least you want to consider yourself a Democratic senator. Like, who do you work for at the end of the day? And the people who you work for are the co- people who come to check in your office every week about how you're going on with passing this this new legislation here. Just really, just an absolute joke. Uh, and also, kind of a shame that we don't see a little bit stronger activism on this in terms of the pushing and making sure that these senators are held accountable. Uh, and that comes from the activists, but also comes from the freaking media, which has completely uh, ignored this story 
on a large scale. I mean, we've seen some independent media talking about this. And of course, you can find about it here on Newsflash, which is your number one spot uh, here on the Spencer Walsh Radio Network in general for just knowing uh, stuff that you need to know about the world that a lot of people aren't going to be telling you uh, for whatever reason. And it doesn't just, other than that, it doesn't seem like it hasn't gotten much broad play. All right, we're going to move on now to our next story in just a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to the Spencer Walsh Radio Network. I want to tell you a little bit about our lineup for this summer. We start off with News Flash, all new, of course, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. You can't miss it. It's our flagship show to get caught up on everything happening in the world around you. But stick around for some history and some entertainment. Learn about all the things you never learned in history class every Thursday with Hidden History. And get ready for a fun night out or turn your living room into the club with uncultured live mixes every Saturday all summer long. The Spencer Walsh Radio Network is your home for summer sounds coming all season long. Every podcast is available everywhere, so you have no excuse not to listen. So a very, very interesting, and I, I, you may have been able to tell I'm paying a little bit of attention to uh, British politics because whenever there's a you know former prime minister there who comes into the fray and says something big, it's always a rare intervention from Tony Blair or whatever. But um, yeah, so we, ha- we have a rare intervention in this case from George W. Bush the president from 2000 to 2008. Um, if you're if you're not aware, if you've never heard of George W. Bush, uh, and he has been out there criticizing President Joe Biden, and it's you know he did he did it to Trump, he did it to um, I don't I don't think he said anything negatively about Obama, but he has come out, and I don't know why people are asking him. But it's, it's very I think bad, and I think it's a good sign that. You know, people aren't taking him seriously on this because the people most likely to take him seriously on this uh, are Democrats. And we'll get to why in a second. But first, let's go here to the AP. Uh, Former President George W. Bush criticized the Western withdrawal from Afghanistan in an interview with German broadcaster released Wednesday, saying he fears that Afghan women and girls will suffer unspeakable harm. Asked in an interview with German international broadcaster Deutsche Welle whether he thinks the withdrawal is a mistake, he replied, you know, I think it is, yeah, because I think the consequences are going to be unbelievably bad. First of all, Deutsche Welle, you know, don't talk to George W. Bush, especially, I mean, maybe you maybe you can, it's all right, because it's good content, but George W. Bush should not be ever able to offer opinions on foreign policy because he led an illegal war uh, that was literally in the wrong place. With, uh, with the Iraq war that completely uh, attacked and really destroyed that country, like comp- pretty much raised that country to the ground. Um, the electricity levels were worse after after the U.S. invaded and supposedly, you know, fixed the place up. They're still not the same as they were under years of sanctions in Iraq. Um, people in that country are still being born with, like, birth defects because we use depleted uranium there. He does not care about uh, women, girls, men, boys, grandparents, you know, dogs, cats, whatever in that country. He has made it clear he doesn't care about them in Afghanistan or anywhere in the Middle East uh, because, you know, for whatever reason. You can, you can fill, in the, fill in the blank there about, you know, why he doesn't care about them. But I think it's, he's made it clear he doesn't care about their rights. Um yeah, <laughs> it's it's clear. It's, it's not about we want to restore democracy and human rights. Like, please. Uh, but uh, for for those of you who may not know, the war in Afghanistan did begin under Bush in after the September 11th attacks on the United States. Washington gave Taliban leader Mullah Omar an ultimatum, hand over al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden, and dismantle militant training camps or prepare to be attacked. Omar refused and led a U.S. coalition... Uh, 
and the U.S.-led coalition launched an invasion in October of that very same uh, very same year, September, or sorry, October 2001. So pretty much what happened there was we got in the country where, again, our main objective was to take out the Taliban, take out al-Qaeda. Really, al-Qaeda was the biggest uh, proposition, and we tried to take out the Taliban because they were a pretty big force there. Uh, and then myself, we did the Taliban thing pretty easily. We killed pretty much their biggest guys um, very, very quickly within, you know, the first few months, actually. Um, Mullah Omar himself, the, the guy, the former Taliban Mujahideen commander, um, he was killed in, actually, he was killed in 2013. Um, but a lot of the biggest leaders, especially in al-Qaeda, uh, except for, by the way, Osama bin Laden, who the pretty much the Bush administration gave up on uh, trying to capture and said, oh, yeah, let's just go for Iraq instead. Um, they, they were killed pretty quickly. But what do we do for the next 20 years? We, we fought the Taliban. We, we tried to, you know, reestablish peace or whatever in Afghanistan and, and build them back up for, you know, over the course of 20 years. Each time we tried to leave, we've seen all the videos of Obama promising it, Trump promising it. It's, it's been promised before. And then instead, we still fall in the same trap, like the one being set by a lot of the U.S. media and by someone like George W. Bush. What's going to happen to Afghan women and girls? You know, it's it's awful to say, you know, just like, you know, you don't want suffering to happen anywhere or to anyone in the world. But whatever happens to them... It's something that we, at this point, 20 years in, it's very fair to say whatever happens to them is out of our hands. We do not have, a, as a country, have the ability to control it. We can talk about why that is, and I think um, I think there's a, there's a very, very interesting conversation, but what we cannot do is just continue to dither there, spend, you know, what what was the, the grand to- cost of 20, I think it was like $100 million dollars. Um, sp- that we spent money um, in terms of uh, money over there. I think probably more than that. But what we what we did there instead was w- like l- looking at the way things are now. Like right after we leave, we hear all these horrific stories. Oh, these these troops are turning and running. The Taliban are immediately uh, gaining background and and like d- dominating much of the the Afghan. Um, co- uh, territory like they're retaking a lot of the afghan territory they're threatening government there it's not that strong but if you look at the situation we've been there for 20 years we had all the time in the world to build up and secure and you know fortify the country actually train troops and uh, train security forces and build them up so the fact that when we left in the first two seconds they wouldn't be overrun by the taliban and the taliban may actually be able to like (laughs) <laughs> and I don't know, defend themselves or to uh, that may have they may have a little bit of a tougher time taking back such the country because we trained, you know, anti Taliban forces to uh to protect themselves. I mean they're incredibly corrupt. That's the thing. It's not like we, we couldn't do it but uh on our own. But you know, there's certainly a lot of corruption there going on. But I think the most important thing to remember here is that when it comes to withdrawing from the Afghan war, there's going to be bad things that happen in Afghanistan after we leave. Um, and they, what I, and to give credit to Joe Biden here, he has been very, very good on this. He made, he made a great point. It was like, do, when, when asked, it was like, do, do you think that you bear the responsibility for what happens in Afghanistan, uh, after you leave? And he said, no, my responsibility is to not waste American money, not waste American lives in Afghanistan any longer than I think it's necessary. And clearly it's not necessary. We've been there for 20 years. No progress has been made. All that's been, all that's really happened is that the national security industry, whether that be, you know, national security advisors making careers about talking about why Afghanistan is so bad or defense contractors who are doing these kind of private missions in there. Think people like Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman who are selling all these weapons to people like Blackwater and all, not Blackwater anymore, but these tons of like private uh, defense industry contractors out there doing, doing the bidding and making a lot of people rich. That makes it a lot easier a lot easier for, and that is, of course, you know, just in the same way Exxon is a hidden kind of policy force as to why we never get any climate change action. 
those people, those forces, the national security state, the military industrial complex are the reason why we don't get out of places like Afghanistan. And credit to Joe Biden for realizing it and saying that this is a trap that we cannot keep falling into. We cannot keep going through the same cycle over and over again about, oh, maybe it'll it'll, it'll be better if we do this. We need to, you know, define our victory. And that's that's how we're going to have a path. No, like we are dealing with corrupt people. We are corrupt ourselves. And no one really is serious about what's doing what doing what's best for the Afghanistan people. Uh, so I think it's very, very important to to realize that. So it's unbelievable how society has changed from the brutality of the Taliban all of a sudden, sadly. I'm afraid Afghan women and girls are going to suffer unspeakable harm, he said. During the Taliban's rule in the late 1990s, this is Bush, who said that uh, women were largely confined to their homes. Girls had no access to education. Despite protest stations from the U.S. and Europe, the Taliban enforced its extreme version of Islamic Sharia law. However, there was no mass violence against girls and women. I'm sad. Laura and I spend a lot of time with Afghan women, and they're scared and... <sighs> Oh, this guy, the unmitigated goal, like the fact that he's doing this after all the things he did in Afghanistan, all the things he did to destabilize the Middle East more than anybody else. He's now concerned after all the time he spent with Afghan women and girls about what's going to happen to them after there are not, you know, U.S. backed warlords going around raping people. Uh, you want to know how many of those included women and girls? Probably a pretty fair bit. You know, I'm going to go out there and say probably a pretty fair bit. Like, these are warlords that were propping up in Afghanistan that literally are pedophilic. Like, we, you, if you want to get into all the things that we're doing there, all the things, the, the, the times where we tried to convince the American people that, oh, yeah, we're making progress, we're defining, we're changing our victory, we're getting so close to the strategy, you know, like all these kind of bullshit military terms that have been used. Um, yeah, you can do that, but it's clear that this is not working and we need to give the Afghan people at least a chance to get out from out from under it. Whatever happens, happens there. But we cannot keep doing what we are doing. All right, let's move on now to our next story um, where Ken Starr is actually the, the big guy in this one. He is the lawyer who handed Bill Clinton over his affair. Uh, by the way, this this uh, in, in The Guardian here, um, our last... Last story was in the AP, as I think I mentioned. Um, this is, uh, yeah, Ed Pilkington <laughs> writing in, in The Guardian. Ken Starr, the lawyer who hounded Bill Clinton over his affair with Monica Lewinsky, waged a scorched earth legal campaign to persuade federal prosecutors to drop a sex trafficking case against a billionaire financier, Jeffrey Epstein, related to the, to the abuse of multiple underage girls, according to a new book. In Perversion of Justice, the Miami Herald reporter Julie K. Brown where it's about Star's role in the secret 2008 sweetheart deal. Again, this was the this was the first deal. This was not anything that happened after he was arrested the second time two years ago in the in the lead up to his suicide. This was back in 2008, where there was a huge legal effort, a quote unquote dream team uh, of sorts, people like Alan Dershowitz uh, lining up for Jeffrey Epstein's defense, and you know. One of the other, you know, Alan Dershowitz was in the big Epstein defender at the time. He was also someone who known to enjoy uh, the, the the amenities of the Lolita Express. Um, no word yet on Star's, uh, Star's position on that, whether he liked to uh, fly in the high skies. But what we do know here is that uh, he was helping. Ken Star was helping. Um, the author is credited blowing open the cover up here in this this 2008 uh, sweet deal, which is pretty much he got 13 months in prison for I think was the charge was like soliciting prostitution and it was a county jail where he had his own private wing to himself. Like underage girls were still visiting him, quote unquote, in the prison, and he pretty much could leave 12 hours a day on work release. That was the that was a sweetheart deal that they got <laughs> for him, and Ken Starr helped get. This is a guy, again, who was raping girls left and right. Um, the book says the, that the emails and letters sent by Starr and Epstein's then-criminal defense lawyer, Jay Lefkowitz, showed that the duo were campaigning to pressure J uh, the Justice Department to drop the case. Starr had been brought into center stage of Epstein's legal team because of his connections to Washington and the Bush administration. Perversion of Justice will be published next week. When Epstein's lawyers appeared to be falling, failing in their pressure campaign, with senior DOJ officials uh, concluding that, yeah, this guy probably pretty guilty, Starr pulled out all the stops. 
Brown discloses that he wrote an eight-page letter to Mark Phillip, who had just been confirmed as the U.S. Deputy Attorney General, the second most powerful prosecutor in the country. Phillip was a former colleague at Starr's law firm, uh, Kirkland and Ellis. It was not his law firm, but he, they both used to work together. Brown write, write that, wrote that Starr deployed dramatic language in the letter reminiscent of the Starr report, which was his lurid and salacious case, which again was supposed to be about the Whitewater like, real estate deal, I think it was, that ended up turning to be the uh, Monica Lewinsky scandal. Um, in the letter, Starr began affably invoking the finest traditions of fairness and integrity of the GO- DOJ. He then goes on to deliver what Brown calls a brutal punch, accusing prosecutors involved in the Epstein case of misconduct and trying to engineer a plea deal with a billionaire that would benefit his friends. Um, Brown reported that Epstein's legal team also went after someone at the Justice Department, Marie uh, Villafania, the lead federal prosecutor in the case accusing her of similarly distorting negotiations to benefit a friend of her boyfriend, an allegation she denied. So, again, pretty much the we're getting an idea of really here what Starr tried to do to get Epstein off. Uh, this is, again, someone who had, you know, not too much respect, but some credibility in right-wing circles. I doubt this is going to hurt him too much with professional job opportunities because somehow no one <laughs> with associated with Epstein seems to suffer that much. Except for maybe Alan Dershowitz. He's not doing too well, right? But, um, yeah, uh, but still, he, it's not like he had, he was a, he was a big TV star to begin with, but it's very interesting to know that Star was used for his connections, uh, and really tried to do everything he could to get to the Justice Department. Um, he, yeah, accused prosecutors of involved in the Epstein case of misconduct to try and engineer a plea deal with the billionaire that would benefit their friends. And unclear whose friends they were going to benefit, but like, and which which friends were they? We don't really know. Um, and how they would benefit the friends, it's, it's not really laid out here in this article, but, and of course you did the thing with uh, Villafania. Um, so Brown cites un, cited unnamed prosecutors linked to a 2008 case who said of the legal campaign in which Star was central that it was a scorched earth defense like I had never seen before. Marie broke her back trying to do the right thing, but someone was always telling her to back off. Um, yeah, so Marie Villafania, probably the only person, lead federal prosecutor in the case, was like, yeah, we should probably do this, but got so much pressure, she eventually was forced to back off. Uh, the prosecutor added that someone in Washington, the book did not specify who, was quote-unquote calling the shot on the case. It would be interesting to know who that person was. Villafania warned fellow prosecutors at the time that Epstein was probably still abusing underage girls, but according to the unnamed prosecutor quoted by Brown, it was clear that she had to find a way to strike a deal because a decision had already been made not to prosecute Epstein, even though she was supposed to be the lead prosecutor on that case. The outcome of this process was a secret deal that only became public years later, largely through Brown's own reporting. Given the number of victims and the severity of the allegations, Epstein got off exceptionally lightly with a sentence that, again, saw, saw him serve just 13 months in jail. During a sentence, Epstein was allowed to work, quote-unquote, in his private office um, for 12 hours a day, six days a week, in breach of jail norms. Um, he, yeah, he, he was allowed out to work from jail 12 hours a day. In 2018, Brown published a three-part expose in the Miami Herald that lifted the lid on the non-prosecution agreement that had been reached covering up Epstein's sex trafficking operation. The reporters managed to identify 80 potential victims, some as young as 13 and 14. Following Brown's expose, a judge ruled that the secret agreement was illegal, opening up the pro- possibility of renewed federal prosecution. Epstein was arrested on the sex trafficking charges in July 2019, uh, 11 years after Starr and the rest of the legal team that had worked so hard to shield him uh, and died in jail in the following month of what was ruled ruled a suicide. And the fallout, Alex Acosta, who was Miami's top federal prosecutor in 2008 and had signed off on the Epstein sweetheart deal, was forced to resign as Donald Trump's labor secretary. Again, he at the time said that Epstein was, quote, intelligence and there was no reason to uh, go and pursue him any further, uh, which was incredibly weird, to say the least. And you, you don't all know the facts about this this uh, investigation. We see, we've had it covered here uh, on the show many times over the, over the past three years at this point. Um, but really, this new detail... Um, and we, do, we did kind of know, again, about Starr's role, anyway, in securing the, the deal... Uh, but Brown's book revealed, revealed that the lengths 
the lawyer was prepared to go to in order to protect from in, to, in order to protect from federal justice and accused sexual predator and pedophile. The extent, extent of his involvement is all the more striking, given the equally passionate lengths that Starr went to in 1998 to pursue Clinton for perjury and obstruction of justice, given the much less serious sexual activity that sparked that investigation. So again, he was freaking out over um, Bill Clinton's um, blowjob in the Oval Office, but you know, all too happy to try and get Epstein off of his charges of procuring uh, pro- procuring sex from children. Um, yeah, so so very very weird. All all this stuff, very very um, eye raising to say the least. Um, but I, if I were Bill Clinton, I would not be raising too many. Uh, I, w- I would not be raising too many issues about Star's context on this given my own uh, proximity to Mr. Mr. Epstein. Anyway, almost time for our next story. Easy no, no need to go down. Rock that run, that this how we frown. Easy no, no need to go down. Easy no, no need to go down. Rock that run, that this how we frown. Easy no, no need to go down. So great to have you here today for News Flash Live. We're talking about today Joe Biden. He's been, you know, not he's always not really been the, the biggest guy in terms of uh, being a left wing standard bearer, being a, a big guy for um, things like the Green New Deal, Medicare for All. But he did make an effort. He's always said he wanted to improve climate, uh, our our uh, climate change uh, situation here, uh, help. Be, be a friend to the climate, pretty much. But things are not not looking too good on that front for Biden at the moment. Again, in the AP here, U.S. drilling approvals have increased despite the Joe Biden climate pledge. Um, approvals for companies to drill for oil and gas on U.S. public lands are in pace this year to reach their highest level since President George W. Bush was the president, underscoring Joe Biden's reluctance to move more forcefully to curb petroleum production in the face of industry and Republican resistance. This is what we're talking about. Industry resistance, and what does industry resistance look like? Exactly like our first story. The Interior Department approved about 2,500 permits to drill on public and tribal lands in the first six months of the year, according to the Associated Press analysis of government data. That includes more than 2,100 drilling approvals since Biden took office January 20th. Uh, the So they got 400 done in just 20 days. It's pretty impressive. Uh, New Mexico and Wyoming, the largest number of approvals. Montana, Colorado, and Utah had hundreds each. Um, Biden campaigned last year and pledges to end new drilling on federal lands to rein in climate change emissions. His pick to oversee those lands, Interior Secretary Deb Holland, adamantly opposed drilling on federal lands while in Congress and co-sponsored the liberal New Deal. But the steps were taken by the administration to date on fossil fuels are more modest, including a temporary suspension on new oil and gas leases on federal lands that a judge blocked last month, uh, blocked petroleum sales in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, and the cancellation of the Keystone XL pipeline from Canada, which is uh, which unambiguously is a good thing, uh, because vast fossil fuel reserves are already under lease. Those actions did nothing to slow drilling on public lands and water that account for a quarter of U.S. oil production. Further complicating Biden's climate agenda is a recent rise to uh, in gasoline prices to three dollars a gallon so about 79, 79 cents a liter uh, or more in many parts of the country any attempt to limit petroleum production could c- push gasoline prices even higher and risk souring the economic recovery from the pandemic and again there's great ways to supercharge the uh, the recovery for example massive investments in climate based infrastructure Mm-mm-mm. without Freaking people out about gas prices, encouraging government cars, uh, sorry, ele- electric uh, cars. But if you're if you're encouraging electric cars, you can give people jobs to build them. And if people have jobs, they'll have more money in their pockets, and they will be able to afford a little bit more, uh, a little bit higher gas prices temporarily. And this is the thing here: gas prices. They're one thing. And the political situation is one thing. But we are dealing with 
at, like it's not like it's oh we got to do it for the it's it's a political consideration. He's got he he's got to deny some um he he can't block every single uh, permit that that people want because it's just it's it would be too rough politically. Well, the thing about politics is it doesn't matter when we are facing increasing consequences from climate change. The crisis is getting worse. We are seeing massive amounts of climate refugees in other countries already and water levels are rising, you know, all the consequences that we know and have been warned about a gazillion times, especially over the last five years, they are coming to truer and truer every single day. So it is so, so, so important that we have to, uh, like, like, it's so, so important that, like, immediate action has to be done. And it's not like, it, the, the case for, oh, it's just not politically feasible at the moment is utterly irresponsible. I mean, Deb Hol- Holland was... Probably someone who I called the the best uh, pick to um, to to be so the best pick uh, in Biden's cabinet uh, as Interior Secretary, uh, but it really seems like she has strayed away from her Justice Democrat Bernie Crat style roots of being pretty pre- being pretty progressive. And I mean, if you're still allowing people. In the same way to drill on on climate lands, this is going to be, in the end of the day, a much, much bigger deal than, oh, you're throwing like 500, 500 million or whatever, like or 5 million, whatever the, the feasly, measly uh, price is uh, for, for new EVs or whatever climate stuff actually gets passed, if they end up even doing this new... Um, if if they get the bipartisan bill through, which is you know not confirmed, and especially if they don't get the uh, the three trillion dollar reconciliation infrastructure package through, which is really really dicey. Um, even though they seem to be making some progress on it, I would not count those uh, eggs before they have fully fully hatched, um, or those chickens, whatever the expression is. Would be eggs though. It makes more sense. It would be eggs. Um, anyway, so Holland has sought to tamp down on a public concern over potential constraints on the industry. She said during a House Natural Resources Committee hearing last month, there was no plan right now for a permanent ban. Gas and oil production will continue well into the future. and We believe that's the reality of the economy and the world we are living in, Holland told Colorado Republican Doug Lamborn. Well, good. Uh, here, here's the thing, Deb. The world I'm going to be living in after you die may really, really, really suffer because of the decisions you are making right now. And for that reason, I would like to say you are despicable for doing this and you, like, the the liberal propaganda that we see from, you know, establishment mainstream sources about how progressive and how amazing and how super strong and brilliant and powerful Biden is on this is really, really starting to wear on me. And I will do my best to uh, to call it out on this show. But if you see it, if if you see all this stuff that oh Biden's the most progressive president ever on climate change, no, like this is stuff that he thinks he can do behind people's backs, and no one's going to notice. But in the end, people notice, and the bill always comes due. And a lot more often than not, it's going to come due in the form of these tragic wildfires, massive flash flooding, increased hurricanes. And mass human suffering. Um, so yeah, that bill will come due, and it's getting closer to coming due every single day. Even as great progressive Deb Holland says that oil and gas production is going to continue well into the future. All right, this is a little <laughs> crazy story here. Uh, this is Jair Bolsonaro, president of Brazil. He's in the hospital for hiccups as they persisted now for more than ten days, according to the Guardian. Um, the Brazilian president, Jair Bolsonaro, has been admitted to hospital, admitted to hospital, uh, complaining of abdominal pain after being struck down by an unremitting bout of the hiccups, which has lasted for more than 10 days. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro, this is a guy who has been one of the most anti-LGBT, like super socially conservative, just awful, awful guys, really attacked Brazil's poor, Brazil's working class, and uh, the rainforest, by the way, the Amazon rainforest, preventing mass, mass deforestation, the, been pretty much the lumber industry's best friend uh, when it comes to 
you know, what is it, a quarter of the world's oxygen coming from the Amazon rainforest or something crazy like that. Um, but it, yeah, the bill, the bill for him, as we talked about, is is starting to come due. He's a 66 year old. He was taken to a military hospital in the capital, Brasilia, at around 4 a.m. on Wednesday, with one prominent Brazilian journalist claiming the president was suffering from a bowel obstruction. In a brief statement, the presidency said Bolsonaro was in good spirits and doing well, but would remain under observation for up to 48 hours. Tests were being carried out to investigate what was causing the hiccups. The Folha de Sao Paulo newspaper reported that Antonio Luis Macedo, the surgeon who operated on Bolsonaro after he was stabbed shortly before his 2018 election, was on his way to the hospital. Like, looks like they got a call on the same guy, you know, like, get him back. And by the way, the surgeon was not the one stabbed, Bolsonaro was. Um... The state of Bolsonaro's health has been the subject of growing media speculation in recent days after Brazil's far-right leader made a succession of public appearances in which he visibly struggled to speak because he was hiccuping too much. During a trip to southern Brazil last Friday, Bolsonaro reportedly had to abandon dinner after feeling ill. In a recent social media broadcast, Bolsonaro said his hiccups had started after he went under, underwent dental surgery on the 3rd of June and blamed it on drugs he had been prescribed. So it's been going on for you know a month and a half now. It's insane. Um... The full the full house said that this is the newspaper there that said that um, Bolsonaro had undergone a series of surgical procedures since his election trail stabbing, an event many believed helped propel him to the presidency. Less than two months later, he won in a landslide election victory against his left wing rival Fernando Haddad. Um, in recent weeks, Bolsonaro had been plunged into what analysis called the worst moment of his two and a half year presidency, with the popularity in free fall amid mounting public anger of, over his handling of the COVID-19 pandemic his failure to secure sufficient vaccinations. Not only has the, like, he just literally let people die en masse, held mass, mass rallies right through the heat of the COVID pandemic, there has been also a really deadly Manaus variant there that developed where he pretty much did nothing to to help handle. Um, And, you know, he, on top of that, has failed to uh, pers- he has failed to uh, s- uh, secure sufficient vaccinations for Brazil. So really, really devastating stuff. All the better for uh, Mr. Lula Inácio da Silva, um, who will be by pretty much by all accounts running against him in the next year's elections, 2022, and is doing quite well by all accounts. So yeah, more than 535 Brazilians have been killed by this illness that Bolsonaro has trivialized as a little flu and polls suggest that Bill's, Brazil's president will fail to win the second term in next year's presidential election because Lula is free, baby. It's a good story. Hopefully, uh, Lula will be uh, laughing instead of hiccuping uh, sometime next year when he wins that election. All right. So all the time we got for you guys today. Thank you so much for listening. We will see you this Friday.